All right, everybody. Uh, afternoon. We're in the home stretch. In a couple more minutes, we'll be playing uh, uh, bowling and we'll be drinking beers. So we're on the home stretch now. Uh, I'm Rich Boyd, and this is my talk, Microchips and Salsa, Securing the Software Supply Chain. A uh, little bit about me. I'm a technical principal at a company called the Atrio, and we help enterprise customers adopt DevOps fundamentals through pairing and coaching. Uh, I'm also a DevOps Days Austin organizer, and our event is happening May 2nd and 3rd this year. It is our 12th year, uh, so we're, we're really proud of ourselves. Uh, I'm also a Cloud Austin meetup organizer on the side. Um, I've got two decades of experience in systems engineering, site reliability engineering, DevOps, and whatever we're going to call it next. Um, I'm a husband, father, and cat dad to two stupid kittens and one old cat, uh, and I'm also an OIF veteran. And if you want to find me, I'm at Richard Boyd II and all the things. So here's the agenda for today. We're going to start talking about some recent su software supply chain attacks, uh, dig into how the compliance landscape is shifting, uh, talk about Salsa, the Intoto framework, and attestations, uh, talk a little bit about open policy agent, policy as code, and rego policies, and then we'll wrap it all together, and if we've got enough time, we'll have a short Q&A section. So whenever I, I read about trying to fix security issues with software, I think of this quote from Bruce Schneier. You know, in a lot of ways, we seem to be trying to fix human-caused security issues uh, with more and more software, which has the effect of creating more vulnerabilities and actually enlarges the attack surface doing the opposite of what we actually set out to do. So it, who remembers SolarWinds? Everybody, right? Uh, in case you were in a coma or living under a rock, uh, in October of 2019, uh, hackers infiltrated uh, SolarWinds software supply chain. They, insure, they inserted a malicious, uh, malicious backdoor into their code base. And then, you know, without SolarWinds knowing it, in March of 2020, they sent that backdoor out to 18,000 of their customers. Right? It was a major impact. It affected not only the private sector, but many government agencies in the public sector. Uh, and, and it really was, I think, the most spectacular supply chain attack we'd seen to date. Now, more recently, we have the XZ software supply chain attack. And we talked about that a little bit in the keynote on Tuesday morning. But if you, if you don't know the basics of it, some person named John Tan infiltrated the XZ maintainer community starting all the way back in October of 2021 and used social engineering to infiltrate their way into that community and get maintainer rights. And then in February of this year, they inserted a backdoor into the XZ library. Now, lucky for us, a security researcher named Andre Frund found that backdoor during performance testing and notified Debian and Red Hat. Red Hat issued a CVE, Debian issued a rollback, and only about 2% of global machines were affected by the backdoor. Um, but these go to show you that software supply chain attacks are, are here to stay, and their effects can be disastrous. Um, this is from the Salsa Frameworks website, and it shows you what the attack surface is of your software supply chain. I, I personally can attest to this, that I've taken it for granted that our CI and CD systems and our Git repos were secure. You know, we've always thought that that's the part of our infrastructure that nobody's going to mess with. And what we've learned is that's not the case. Um, you know, we've learned that we live in a world now where we have to harden our software supply chain as much, if not more, than our production systems. And from malicious dependency injection to compromised build servers, there's a huge attack surface that our CI CD infrastructure presents. So in response to the SolarWinds attack, uh, President Biden issued Executive Order 14028. Um, and this thing's got a lot of teeth to it. Um, it's aimed at improving the nation's ability to identify, deter, protect against, detect, and respond to malicious cyber activity in the face of, and I quote, persistent and increasingly sophisticated malicious cyber campaigns that threaten the public sector, the private sector, and ultimately the American people's security and privacy. Now, what this executive order does, it mandates encryption at rest and in transit for government agencies. Uh, it mandates that they, go, they move to zero-trust architectures, uh, mandates that they uh, implement multi-factor authentication. Um, it also sets up a threat response and information sharing process between private sector and public sector. What it also does is it mandates that any organization selling software to the U.S. government issue a software bill of materials along with that software. And we all know that as the U.S. government goes one way, industry is going to soon follow. 
And so as a consequence of that executive order, NIST released two special publications, uh, SPs 800-218 and 800-204-D. 800-218 lays out a national cybersecurity strategy and makes a case that the shift in the burden of cybersecurity has to move from the people that consume software to those that actually produce the software. Uh, it lays out a series of guiding principles that it encourages agencies in the public and private sector to adopt, including such things as securely archiving the necessary files and supporting data, e.g. integrity verification information and bill providence data uh, to be retained for each software release, uh, collect, safeguard, maintain, and share providence data for all software releases, and verify that acquired commercial open source and all other third-party software components comply with your security requirements. NIST 800-204-D is more of a roadmap, and it's designed to navigate the complexities of securing the software supply chain. It offers more than just technical guidance. It actually is supposed to foster a cultural shift within organizations, emphasizing the importance of security at every step of the software build process, from the initial lines of code to the final deployment. So we talked a little bit about software bill of materials. This right here is a software bill of materials for Keycloak. It is just over 60,000 lines. So a human can't be expected to read this 60,000 line JSON file and much less all of the other software bill of materials that you may need to deal with, right? How many open source projects are you using in your infrastructure or your product? How many more SBOMs do you have to potentially need to process in order to ensure that your software supply chain is actually secure? So when it comes to handling SBOMs, there's a couple of tips I can offer you. Uh, one, choose a format and stick to it. There are several out there like SPDX, Cyclone DX, and SWID. Um, you need to index these. So you can use open source tools like Manticore Search, like Apache Solar, or even OpenSearch to index your software bill of materials and make them searchable and discoverable and analyzable. And then don't forget about data retention requirements. This software bill of materials is 2.2 megs. Multiply that by possibly hundreds of attestations produced by your build processes every day, multiplied by six, you know, five days a week, 251 days a year, potentially talking about gigabytes of software build materials you have to retain. And if you're in a highly regulated industry, you may have to retain those for up to seven years. So we've talked about software build materials. Let's shift a little bit and talk about our actual software supply chain and our build system. Um, so the Salsa framework is designed to uh, provide a kind of guidance and, and uh, guidance and procedures to support to secure our CI/CD systems. Um, it makes sure that the source code that you're relying on is the source code you're actually using. And without a solid foundation and a plan for the system as it grows, it's difficult to focus your efforts against tomorrow's next hack, breach, or compromise. So Salsa is a checklist of standards and controls to prevent taper, tampering, improve integrity, and secure packages and infrastructure. Um, the build levels validate the security of the software supply chain. Software supply chain should be tamper-proof, e.g. no injections or overrides. They should be hermetically sealed. And along the way, as your artifact moves from source code to actual artifact, you should generate provenance in the form of attestations about the artifact itself to verify that it went through the right security scans and, and quality control gates and testing. It just hit version 1.0 and it's still evolving, um, but it's actively maintained. Uh, so I mentioned the word attestations and when we talk about software attestations, we're talking about generating provenance for an artifact. Um, the Intoto attestation framework provides a specification for generating verifiable claims about how a software artifact was built, what was done to that artifact to ensure that it was secure, it was tested, et cetera. Um, it provides provenance, which is verifiable information about the software artifact. There are four common parts to an attestation, the predicate, the statement, the envelope, and the bundle. Now, there's a lot of types of, of predicates for Intoto attestations that you can use off the shelf, including Salsa build provenance, um, SBOM format provenance, uh, or you can even create your own predicate if there's not one that matches your use case. 
when it comes to making attestations useful, we recommend that you use extension fields. So in this attestation, I've added a couple of extension fields that add rich metadata to an, to an attestation itself. So in this example, I've added fields for the attestation UUID, the commit hash, the project name, the version of software, and the result of policy evaluation. When it comes to storing attestations and signing attestations, the SIG store stack is one that we've had a lot of um, success in implementing with our customers. Um, Cosigns used to sign OCI containers, artifacts, and also attestations. Uh, Fullcio is uh, used to issue short-lived certificates so that those can be signed securely. And then Recore is an immutable tamper-resistant ledger that you can use to store attestations in. Uh, we're going over a little bit. Uh, Open policy agent, so we've generated attestations, now we need to validate that they've followed our policy, and we can use OPA to validate policy as code. Uh, OPA uses Rego, pronounced you know, Rego, uh, as a policy language, and it decouples policy decisions from policy enforcement. So some tips about Rego policy. Um, in the header field, you can leverage custom metadata to add stuff like version of the uh, of the policy or a control number. You can use your main.rego file as a router to match to sub policies. Um, make sure to use message fields to add supporting contextual information about why a policy may be denied or allowed. And if you just do deny only policies, it actually slims up the amount of policy language you have to use. So lastly, putting all these things together, uh, this is a, a reference implementation that we've, we've built at several customers. Um, the CICD server uses Cosign to generate and sign artifacts and attestations. The attestations are then validated against an OPA policy sidecar. We take the result of that OPA policy result, we inject that back in the attestation and store it in Fulcio, or store it in Recore. We use Recore search to view the raw attestation, and Recore stores the attestation in an S3 bucket. The S3 write event writes to a Lambda that writes to an open search index that auditors and compliance experts can use to sort, analyze, and view attestations. So in recap, software supply chain attacks will continue to increase because they're effective. Securing your software supply chain is the day zero duty. Regulations and compliance frameworks are finally catching up to software supply chain attacks. Generating SBOMs is not enough. You've got to make them actionable. Attestations provide provenance about how an artifact was constructed, and Rego policies allow you to articulate compliance and governance and evaluate attestations. Uh, there are links in the slides that are uploaded to SCED, so if you want to follow those, and thank you so very much for your time today.